We've had, uh, in, in Brian's presentation, a, a, a new look at the, uh, the same theme we've, we've seen uh, throughout today, this notion of how products are developed and, and delivered to market. And uh, I think it really uh, was a very fitting uh, presentation to be closing our, our a, a seminar on. We do want to now come to a time where we have an opportunity to um, uh, discuss and reflect and question uh, some of the ideas that we've seen so that we can take away some of uh, the ideas that perhaps uh, you can innovate uh, with yourself or, or bring back and, and reflect on it and, and, and develop something new from, from today. So before we go on, what I'd like to do is to just uh, ask each of our uh, presenters to uh, perhaps reflect on the, on, on the overall session we've had today and uh, to give your, your thoughts before we move into to, to audience questions. So can I um, start with um, uh, Bob? We, if you look to Australia as a market on itself, you, the market is small. If you look to uh, the northern uh, hemisphere, north of Australia, there's a few guys living over there. Um, off season, not, not well, well fed. If you look at China in winter time, there's lack of produce. If you look at Japan in winter time, it's very costly. Um, and one of the things I'm thinking about is that in an expensive country, don't even think about producing cheap. Cheap things you make in cheap countries, expensive you make in expensive countries. So you have to think about added value. And if you just go here to be cheapest of Asia, forget it, you lose it, there's no way. You have to be something, you have to use the education of the uh, institutes you have over here. You have this uh, QDPA, which is a very smart organization. You have a lot of scientists running around over here. So combine that information and make it an added value for uh, other markets or your own market. Thank you. Roger, would you like to reflect on what we've talked about today? I really like Rob's point that uh, um, healthy eating is the most important thing we can do for ourselves and what a great industry to be in. It's, a, it's not like we're trying to sell cornstarch or, or meat, you know. It's <laughs> sure. And uh, Corn syrup. Yeah. Um, Brian, I like Brian's point. It was a subtle point, but it really re resonated with me that uh, if you can design good shelf life in your product, don't give that all to the retailer. Tell him he only has six days and then let the other eight days be for the consumer to delight him. I thought that was an interesting point. It, uh, um, but there's, and there's been good discussion afterwards too that uh, mm -hmm. we talked about biodegradable and why none of us talked about that and how hard that is. And we, we, um, there, there's the, 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 the new store formats in, in the US and Europe, the, the smaller stores and um, just been a lot of really good information shared and uh, some of these trends are probably already here in Australia and uh, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful area of opportunity. It's a great, great market to be in. Mm. Brian? Uh, yes, as, as far as the product that we are dealing with is very clear, it is as Rob called it in the prior session, is real food. So we don't have to worry about that. And uh, you know, our, our products are healthiest product, no question, overall I'm talking about. And our people who are involved in this practice, they are closest to nature. They are uh, closest to the environment. Naturally, they are authority to speak about health and nature and what is naturally, historically, has been good for us. We have definitely forgotten that as, as different societies around the world. And it's, it's really up to us. Uh, it's a big fight. Uh, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables are, uh, they are, we are not as big yet. You know, uh, there are a lot of money involved in marketing and uh, uh, convincing consumers about the products that are not good for, for us. But our products naturally are good for the consumer. So it's up to us uh, to find ways uh, to uh, let the consumer know more about the product, educate consumers in this process, and create value that they are craving for naturally. 
They may not even know that. So it's up to us really to tell the story of our product. Mm. Thank you. So I'd like now to, to, to open the, uh, the floor to, to, to questions and comments, if any of you have them. Just put up your hand. We have a microphone. I'd like to ask uh, if, if you do have one to just uh, introduce yourself to the group and uh, tell us where you're from. Hi, uh, Richard Dickman from Bayer. Um, uh, a question perhaps to Brian, but also to the panel. I mean, this reference to real foods and, and so on, can you expand a little bit on that, what, what, what that actually means? And, um, and again, uh, this question of really cutting through to the consumers. I mean, ha has there been any good examples of, uh, in your experience where, where companies have been able to cut through and, and, uh, and really demonstrate that uh, the foods are real foods and, and so on? And how did they do that? Examples of real food? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Where, you know, examples where <laughs> You know, they've, they've, they've had an advertising or, or they've used a celebrity or they've got a particular way of positioning it so that they get this message through. Right. Uh, you know, the reason I called it real food because it is, it is the, the, the more natural food closest to the natural shape of products uh, right after harvest is the best we can have. Uh, of course, we need to understand the, the properties of the food. Uh, and to, to select right, to talk about it right. Uh, and that's what I meant by real food. And, and it happens the consumer also respond the same way. Uh, the, the, the less processed and the, the, the more uh, they can relate and connect to the product, uh, the better uh, uh, they respond to it. You can see that in reflection of the trends of clean labels. You know, consumers are tired of reading, uh, you know, on they can understand, they can pronounce uh, the content of the product. So natural products are less, uh, you, you know, they, they don't need to explain themselves. They're already self-explanatory. So the more uh, simple we present the product to the consumer, the better success we have to, to show real food. Use of, uh, you know, uh, I think we can use any, uh, any means we can uh, to uh, uh, improve the, the, the reality at the same time, the image of the product we have. Use of celebrities may help uh, or not, but the, the, they have to deliver the real message. You know, I don't think the long-term strategy for fr fresh fruits and vegetables lies in, in perception. You have to cover perception to some extent, but the real, real opportunity long-term is, again, we have the real food. We need to just communicate that to the consumer better. And that's the win-win, rather than trying to uh, pretend that our food is real. Neil's from the Australian newspaper. Um, just following on from that question, I guess you're talking about all these trends being towards natural and less tampering with and, and real food. Where does that leave a lot of the new developments that end up being a purple carrot or potato or something that uh, with genetic engineering involved? What does the consumer think of genetic engineering? Can you repeat the question? Because so the, the, the question is, is uh, with some of the new products like, like uh, pur purple potatoes uh, that, are, that are arguably unnatural and genetic engineering, wh how do cons consumers perceive these new products and how do you sell them? Okay. Can I take this question? Yeah, please. Um, nature is so rich. There are so many things not explored. I mean, the, the conquistadores went to South America and they did an cherry picking of the easy ones, the tomatoes, peppers, and the, and the potatoes. But I've been to South America a few times. I've been shopping around over there. There's so much more to eat and to find in the world which is healthy, beautiful, and so on. It's just not really picked. Um, potatoes with different colors, it's existing. I mean, the Incas were, were most probably having a breeding program because the galore is so big over there that you're, you're surprised. I've seen 800 different uh, potato varieties not known in the Western world. Um, so, I'm not by, de by definition against GMOs, but let's first see what we have available before we start all these tricks, because you don't need the tricks, we can find them just in nature. Real food is real food, and it's, it exists, I mean, it exists in Australia, I've been in the forest uh, shopping around a bit uh, la this week, and I'm surprised, I will definitely import wild stuff from Australia to, uh, to for gastronomy in Europe. 
Is that an answer to your question? Or? Sorry, could you say the other commentators what their research shows on consumer attitudes to GMOs? I don't get the question. Does but your research do you show... It's very hard to... to, to, to uh, hear. Just is asking about uh, uh, other opinions about research on GMOs and consumer perceptions of them. So do you have any, do you have any uh, uh, ideas you want to share about that? There, there, is, uh, there are a variety of uh, response by consumer. Generally, there is a fear. And probably is a fear on unknown. And... Uh, mostly driven by, uh, in, in my experience, by, by the customers, by the buyers. Uh, every month we receive a, a letter from a buyer telling us, tell us that you do not send anything. Uh, all your products, all your ingredients are uh, non-GMO. While the same buyer, same store, they're, they're selling GMO products all over the store. So uh, the, uh, the really, the, it's a fear uh, driving this thing at this point. It is, uh, I believe, generally, uh, there, there is definitely opportunity for certain functions in the future. Uh, but it is uh, too premature to really uh, uh, focus on benefits. I totally agree with uh, what Rob is talking about. There is, uh, you know, uh, for chopped salad, for example, totally unexplored. Uh, area of the root products, kohlrabi, uh, a number of different root products unknown that simply consumer would love it, uh, and they're all uh, natural products. So uh, I, th I think is 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 like irradiation uh, is another aspect. Of course, Europe is 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 more against it than U.S. There are generally openness in U.S. There there was even experiment of selling irradiated products, actually advertising for it. Uh, of course, it didn't last long. Uh, it, it went on for th a few years in New York areas only. But then uh, it's still uh, uh, GMO products are, are too uh, premature to really have a good assessment of consumer. Fear is dr driving their, uh, their opinion. It's not only fear, it's also uh, the consumer has been cheated a lot last 20 years on food, not a little bit, really cheated. And I think consumers are, uh, they had it. They, they, they don't mess with my food. Don't, don't come with all these things out of my food. It's my food, stay away from it. And there is no real need for it. There's, there's a commercial need for it, for maybe for seed companies or, or multinationals, or people who invest a lot of money in research. But I, I had a very weird debate just a few weeks ago in Holland and a scientist was saying, yeah, we spend so much money on GMOs, it's a waste not to use it. And I said, well, we also spend a lot of money on the, on the atomic bomb, and you better don't use it either. So, um, <laughs> well, that was a killer. But um, there are so many arguments to use GMOs, and if, you, if it comes to the point, it didn't bring us so much so far. Um, so I, it's not, I'm not a full believer of GMOs. I can defend it in some ways, but for vegetables, no need at all. There is so much uh, diversity in vegetables. Never use it. Don't do it. No need. Done deal. Basta. Linton Brimok, I'm Farmer Lockie Valley. I was intrigued by the question of GMOs. I, um, we, we heard from uh, Rob, Rob today and also um, Dr. Hang earlier about the health benefits of, of our food. I, I think the debate I'm seeing is more a comment from our American friends. What is, what is the consumer feeling on the plastics? The, I, I'm just seeing a lot of plastics on those screens. And uh, yeah, is there a comment there, please? What's the consumer feeling about that? About plastics, about Plastic. all the packaging. The, the use of plastics in food as against offering a fresh product. You know, fresh product, obviously, the best is at it, its own natural state with no packaging. But you are obviously facing a distribution. You're facing to extend the time that you need for distribution and for uh, functions that consumers need to have time for it. 
So for that, we are basically forced to use packaging, if, if I may say it that way. But still, you need uh, uh, the container to contain the product and, and unitize it for different purposes. Without packaging, you can't do all those things. Uh, shipping uh, distribution is another reason for it. The attempt uh, is to reduce, reduce the amount of packaging and also reduce the impact of the packaging you use on the environment. Reduce the waste, you reduce the energy, and all these things that you realize. Now, we don't like to use packaging, it's expensive, but there is a, a necessary uh, component of, of distribution and extending the life to the level that we need to for distribution. The, um, th there's, there's, there's two views. It, th there's the idealistic view, and then there's the, the economic view and, and the practical view. If you, if you were to buy a, a package of strawberries and it was in a wood crate, you're going to be skeptical. You know the produce manager is hiding all the, the moldy ones at the bottom of that. You want to be able to flip that over and judge for yourself. And you can't do that with a wood crate, but the wood crate is so much more environmentally friendly. So where do you do? So you, you go for a plastic that has the number one indicia on the bottom. So it, it, it's PET, it's recyclable, and it's clear, it's, and it's inexpensive. So that's a, that's a, it's a reasonable compromise. And then uh, if you have uh, a product that might be a tray product with a, with a, with a film on top and a, and a snap-on lid and then another uh, cardboard uh, uh, sleeve, chipboard sleeve around it, get rid of half that packaging. Do, do a source reduction so you don't have so much and just, just make it a peelable lid. Or if possible, make it a peelable and resealable lid. And that, those, are, those are emerging. It's, it's just a, some cities and, and, and uh, we've made great strides. Plastic takes so long to degrade and if you're driving down the road and you see a plastic bag stuck to a bush, it's just such an eyesore. What, you know, it, whereas if it was a paper bag, it, the rain will pack it down and it'll look like dirt. It's so it, there are certain areas where we want to get rid of plastics and some areas where we just can't. Um, so it's a, it's a fair compromise whenever possible. I think that, I don't know, that's, that's the American, you know, make, make it recyclable. Any other comments from the panel on that? Do you want to say anything, well, Rob? Well, there's, there's something else with the plastics, which what makes me nervous. I didn't realize it so much, but all those, you have this, now this, at this show, that you have the tomato, the tomato ketchup thing, that's before it was glass, now it's plastic, so plastic is better. I know that the plastic, because it's soft, has some of this softening material to it, which is dilute, diluted to the product again. And I hear that a lot of cancers are linked to that kind of thing. And just imagine how much plastic are we, we eating things from and how much they're doing. There's not so much research done on it yet, but what I hear about is the softeners on plastic is not a real good thing. So, yeah, you have to be more creative on that one. Thank you. Uh, Mike Redcock, a farmer from Northwest Coast, Tasmania. Uh, Brian, uh, you mentioned about the organic uh, industry is expanding fairly fast in US of A. Um, what percentage of organic product is on your shelves at the moment and what sort of uh, price premium are these organic products uh, gaining? And maybe Rob could give us an idea of uh, what's happening in Europe. Obviously the rate of growth, what, what I was referring to, and there are definitely different definitions of organic. Uh, the response of consumers to organic product is not necessarily exactly knowing what they are purchasing. Uh, it is organic and really trusting that brand or that product because it's better. But generally uh, is perceived as more wholesome product and is better for me. It has less pesticide in it. And there are certain trust into processes that goes with it. That's the reason behind purchasing it. I don't think it is specifically. There are certain a very low percentage of consumers actually buying organic with a very clear knowledge about what they are buying and with a purpose. And the percentages of the uh, shelf space 
uh, it would be a, just a guess by, by um, my behalf if my colleagues can have a better idea, but I, I won't think that it's at this point it's more than uh, 15 to 20 percent. Well, Europe has many countries with different opinions. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the country which is most important to us for export vegetables is Germany. And uh, the Germans are, are known to be very tough on, um, on clean stuff. They have this thing on beer already for many times that you can't use anything else to beer than uh, the, the real ingredient, water and hops and uh, the germs. Um, in Germany, there's a, yeah, I would say 15% organic is, is there. Um, but I don't know if they really want to have it organic. I think it's more that they want to have it, they want to have it clean. My company, I, I have an organic farm, um, but it's not cleaner or less clean than, the other, than, than my other operation. We per 90 percent we do is not organic, but it's um, I call it myself clean enough. I, I had it a little bit with all this, this, this people judging your company if you're organic or not. Um, I can't use uh, crocodile shit to fertilize my microgreens. Yeah, so I have to do something smart now then I use normal fertilizer because that feels much more safe and I know how to handle that I use homeopathic amounts because my plants don't need so much but um, according to the the, the, the the people really right in the truth on uh, organic I'm wrong I'm not a good organic grower but I sleep very well on that and my customers are very happy with my product I don't spray that's the most important thing for me Trends wise, yes, when I invent something, or when we invent something in the company, we look for something, we always look at can we do it organic or not. If we can't do it, then we're looking for different angles. So it is important for me as a kind of uh, thing on the, on, the, on the horizon where I want to go to. But um, at this moment, I think that the contents are more important than the, the organic part. I have a question I've been waiting to ask uh, since the first morning session. We've seen a lot of the packaging, a lot of the convenience uh, products, and, and we've talked about how those are actually delivered to consumers, but I wonder about the middle people. What, what, what are some of the challenges and innovations going on behind that packaging and to, to cut up the apples, to extend the shelf life? And, and are there challenges that our growers need to be aware of, our, our packagers need to be aware of, in order to achieve that, 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 what we see in those pictures. Where, where's the waste going, for example? Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the investments need to go in to, to, to get to that? I wonder if, if our panelists could comment on that. I can answer from the uh, different aspects since we are involved from the product side, packaging side, and the, the process that goes into it, manufacturing of it. Uh, definitely, altogether, I think we are behind as an industry, we have a lot of opportunity to reduce the waste. Uh, naturally, in our company and many companies in U.S., they use the, uh, the waste uh, remaining of our products uh, for animal feed. And, uh, you know, about maybe I would say easily uh, 30 to 50 percent of uh, the processed uh, or fresh cut vegetables, uh, the, they go to waste. Uh, then uh, dealing with that, as well as then different categories of the packaging material we are dealing with. The, the bulk of raw that comes in uh, during last uh, you know, 10, 15 years, we have uh, converted all those to more reusable containers, bins, bulkier bins, wherever you can really use that. After harvest, we bring it to our facilities like that. So there is a closed loop of containers helped us to uh, improve the waste in that area. In especially California, uh, the water as a resource is very important. There are uh, many companies, they, uh, they have to, whether they like it or not, they're forced to deal with the better, much better water management, recycling it, filtering it, and really looking at water as the most precious commodity we have. Mm. I just want to add that uh, um, the yield factor in, in, in plants is, is so huge that uh, you know when you're cutting, if you're cutting automatically or using a translicer, you're, you're really worried about stem content and and getting the right cut. And yield factors are something that plant managers work are working with all the time, trying to 
to improve that. Everybody's familiar with broccoli slaw. Well, there was a good use for the stem for broccoli. You wanted to have all the florets, but what do you do with the rest of it? And so there, there are little inventions here and there, and, and uh, um, cattle fodder and, and uh, the things like that. Are, you know, you, you know, the pineapple has a huge, huge amount of waste, and so what do you do with that? You can't just flush it down the drain. You've got to you got to find a good use for it. Um, in terms of, of, of making the packaging, um, air quality standards are, are very strict, and uh, you'll find that uh, the, the adhesives and the inks that might have any kind of volatile emissions, they, there, are, there are huge strides in, in the way that those are handled, whether they're pumped into a, a sand pit that has a special organisms that will eat that and, and have an enzymatic activity and just destroy the, the, uh, the bad materials. Or you can have a, a flame burn-off system for, for printing inks and things like that. that, that, and that so the, uh, the environment in terms of creating the packaging has, has had some huge uh, benefits from, from using <laughs> taking away any volatile emissions and, and, and treating those carefully too. There are some opportunities actually to in, in U.S. Some of the fresh cut companies are using it. For example, the, the, the peel and the skin of onions is, is uh, converted to methane and uh, the facility actually using this is self-sufficient from the energy production. It's in Oxnard, uh, uh, close to Southern California. And another opportunity, uh, we have plans for it for like three to five years, is uh, extracting uh, different uh, uh, natural flavors or colors or also the essence, which is the aroma of uh, uh, vegetables. Uh, obviously, if you want to extend the shelf life, you may lose some of the volatiles. Then the natural uh, essence of, let's say, cucumber on a package of cucumber sticks, when consumer opens up, will be naturally the essence of cucumber in it. While, uh, of course, it might sound really out there for Rob, but, but it is uh, some approaches some companies are pursuing. I think another question that comes to my mind is the whole issue of scale. You know, a lot of what we've talked about today seems to me to depend uh, in, in some, some measure on the scale and your ability to achieve scale to, to deliver. Is, is, is that a fair comment? Uh, large scale versus, you know, just the small farmers? Um, where, where does scale fit into this whole discussion? Again, if, you, if you're an expensive country, you cannot produce cheap. That, that doesn't work. So, um, if you want to create added value, then you have a blessed climate, you can grow nearly everything what you want, uh, produce things optimally, and, uh, and work on the content. I, th I think that's something, if you look to all the innovation we've done in horticulture so far, we reached the point that we're no longer innovations. And for me, the next step is the combination of uh, food and health. Um, we will come to a moment that uh, you can talk about personalized food, where I, where I, lo I look a little bit at gaming. Um, I have at home, I have this, uh, this scale for my weight, which is connected to my uh, telephone. So uh, I call it also the white monster. Uh, it's a white one. And it's, it, it's, I, don't, I want to beat that fellow. I don't want to gain weight, I want to lose weight. So I'm, every day I'm checking this guy, and he's, he keeps a nice track on me. But that's uh, okay, it's not always a party because I do all these things of eating out with all these restaurant guys, so <clears throat> nasty. But a Samsung 5 has now a, a system to measure your heartbeat, to measure your steps, to measure your uh, blood pressure. Um, next steps will be something, and something that you stick on your, on your skin and it can tell you your, your insulin con uh, activity. I think within five years time, we'll come to uh, computers who can tell you on your telephone, apps that can tell you how good you're eating and they can measure it in an hour after your meal. That's a big challenge because the biggest gift you can give a person is health. And we're spending fortunes on repairing health, but just preventing health would be very interesting for insurance companies, for instance. 
So if you can prove your insurance company that you're following a good diet, which they can see on your telephone, then uh, maybe you can reduce your your your, uh, your 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 payment of your uh, insurance company. So I think that the link of food and health will come very very rapid, quicker than we all think. I think very much believe in singularity on this one, and I think it health is going to be something like gaming and uh, the ingredients will be vegetables so it's 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 a, it's a nice challenge and i think that uh, the consumer now is further with this than the science the industry and the supermarkets i think the supermarkets are going to suffer soon heavily because people don't no, don't longer want to be cheated they, they have been cheated enough they, they cheated by the insurance companies by the banks by the government by all kind of people they are becoming more on themselves and uh, and to get the ingredients with these new apps to be more under control. I think that's a uh, very interesting challenge and I think that there are two countries in the world where can really benefit from that and the thing is Australia with your scientists and your small market and it is Holland with the scientists and the small market. Um, could be very interesting so uh, let's exchange some students. You know, if you want to pursue many different realities that we are facing I think we, uh, in many aspects, we need to have a scale. If you want to have a better waste management, you have to have a scale. And not in all cases. If you want to encourage or actually enhance, improve uh, consumers' uh, percentages of uh, eating fruits and vegetables, we can't really achieve that globally by, uh, by niche products. We have to have a scale to impact the cost structure so consumer can afford to purchase more products. Of course, uh, you, I'm not denying the small farms or, or, or uh, different specialty products, but overall scale historically has been a major factor in order to uh, make the product available for the consumers. I was kind of thinking about this from a different perspective of, of production scale. Is that what you were thinking? Produ production scale, to be sure, as well as processing scale. I remember in the, uh, the late 1980s, there was no such thing as a salad in a bag in the United States. And virtually every processor came out of grower shippers. They, they evolved. And those that uh, evolved slowly and economically and didn't, didn't get too crazy, uh, and then, then, they, then they sold out that capacity and then they expand a little bit more, um, did very well. And uh, a prime example of, uh, of, one, of a company that didn't do so well there was what Tesco came into the United States and, and started this whole fresh and easy store and they, they built to a scale that where they had so much, that they, they figured they were gonna have 350 stores within two years and they built everything to that scale. Well, if they had just built a little bit smaller, they wouldn't have had to sell out. It might have been more profitable. Um, it, but instead, they have these huge plants that were intended for huge scale, and they never never reached that scale. And so Tesco sold it to, to, uh, to Ron Burkle, and um, he has a different vision, perhaps, uh, of what how, how, that, how that small metro-sized store can be successful. I'm just thinking about how grower shippers are the people who started the processed vegetables and, and those that followed uh, a reasonable scale as they build up were the most successful. Thank you. I don't doubt if there's another question here. I think we'll make this our last question for today. Uh, Nick Crandall again from Western Australia. I'm a retired grower. Obesity. Is obesity in, increasing or improving? Uh, what state is it in the United States? We believe we are on the map. The obesity is uh, catching up on us. We probably consider ourselves related to you people and we follow you maybe a few years later, but we are. Is the obesity one of the reasons why we could 
turn the consumption of vegetable fruit and vegetables more, they can be used. Okay. Um, yes, we can fight uh, obesity. I'm doing a beautiful trial at the moment. Um, about food, there are, there's, there's moments in your life which are uh, life-changing. Uh, so for very often when you have children, you get the first children in your family, you suddenly start thinking about, okay, what are going to feed them? I explained you, you're, you're one year too late, but anyway. Um, another thing is when your doctor says, okay, if you continue like this, in three more months and you can say goodbye to the whole family. That's also a nice life-changing moment. Um, yeah, I'm always quite simple. Um, obesity uh, very often drives the direction of diabetes too. And diabetes too in uh, in Holland is a big issue. It's it's one million people out of uh, uh, eighteen, so it's a big one, and it's going well. So it, it has an, in, an increase of twenty percent per year. So it's really doing very well. And um, I learned from a professor that uh, diabetes too can be reversed with a diet of eight weeks. So what we're doing now is we're doing a test with uh, an insurance company in the north of Holland. We isolate, uh, or we don't isolate, we have 500 uh, men because you have to do a lot of the weighing and things and be public. So women don't like to put on the scale and put how much the weight is. So we take the men and the men are on the moment that they are going to receive uh, medicines or not. They're just at the brink. We're going to guide them for eight weeks with uh, boxes of food. They have to cook themselves at home. And um, the intake is that we will have 50% of the, of the guys reverse and that their diabetes is gone. In the same time, they will lose also weight, about six, seven kilos. If we can, can approve this and we get this done in, uh, in eight weeks, we will publish that globally because that will be a very nice breakthrough. And trust me, they will eat a lot of vegetables. I'm responsible for the diet, so I'll, I'll stuff them with vegetables. <laughs> and just imagine that we can prove that by eating something where we made for you can reverse your diseases it's fantastic so diabetes is a big problem because you don't know how to solve it and I had a big discussion with, with, with animal scientists on, about it because they said look if diabetes was a problem for pigs would have solved it yeah, because you can cut open the pig and you can compare it and so on. It's not allowed with humans, so we don't do that. But we know so much about cattle food and animal food. We know exactly what to put in to have a, a pig producing well and still staying lean. Why don't we know that for humans? We don't, we don't know it. Huh? It's not known. There, there, there are no scientists on this level. So just imagine by proving a new, a new diet and then uh, at a life-changing moment, it's fun. And it's going to work. I'm pretty convinced about it. The prof professor is very clear about it. Of course, everybody is saying it's impossible. That's the point, the moment I like it. This is going to work. And it's going to be very, very funny. Another doctor I'm, I'm dealing with is a, a cardiologist, cardiologist, doctor, a heart doctor, yeah. Dr. Hart. Um, he is, um, he has, when he has to operate, he has a waiting list. And he says to the people who have to operate in three months from now, he said, look, you can do two things. Do like other doctors say, just continue eating, but you do a little bit uh, different things. Or you follow a menu, which I described for you. Six out of 10 don't have to be operated anymore. So we have this very strange industry of cutting and, uh, and pills, who is making a lot of profit, where the cure is just bloody food. And that's, inter that's, that's the business, that's, that's what we should do. It's, it's so easy and we are, we are selling it to against too low prices and we have problems and we have all kinds of things, but we are selling the right thing, we are selling the cure. So obesity, it's an easy one. But we don't have advertisement commercials like uh, the Pepsicos and the Coca-Colas, so that's, that's going to be the enemy. I mean, if I see how much junk you're selling in the supermarkets, if you go to the airport, it's impossible to buy something without sugar. Uh, those things will, will stop. You have to go to vegetables again. Slow released sugars, where we made for. It's very interesting. And if you can make this, just imagine the market north of us in China and India, where obesity is a big, big problem at the moment. We can cure it. Eat more veg. 
I'll that's that's a very comment. exciting note to end on today. Um, we've had a, we've had a, uh, a, I think, a very stimulating and, and really uh, expanding our, our horizons in, in this uh, uh, produce innovation seminar. Um, we've heard about consumer connections and how we need to better work with consumers to inform them about the quality of the products, the notion of convenience and how it's, how it's driving uh, the delivery of produce uh, into markets, particularly in North America, and the opportunities that that presents here in Australia and in the Asian region. Uh, clearly, uh, at the end, we've heard a, a lot about health and well-being, and I think that's a really resonant message that we can use as an industry to deliver uh, to consumers and customers along, along the supply chain to uh, better position and, and ultimately uh, perhaps increase our profitability in sales. I like the, the notion that uh, Brian uh, gave to us that about real food. You know, real food is, is a product that explains itself. And I think that's, that was a, for me, that was a really great message. You know, the, the fresh food explains itself. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, as, as, as we develop a better understanding of the health benefits, that explanation will be loud and clear to, to, to the world. So um, before we close, I'd like to ask uh, each and every one of the uh, members of the audience to take just a few moments to, to complete the feedback form. That's really important for us. Uh, here as part of the convention so we can improve on, on what we've done this year. Um, so they, they should be at each of your places. Um, they're, they're very important at measuring the success of this initiative and helping us to plan for the future. Um, I'd, I'd very much like to thank uh, each of the speakers uh, uh, who are here this afternoon and also to acknowledge those who were here uh, earlier in the day. Uh, we've been treated to some very uh, thought-provoking uh, seminars, that, and, and uh, these speakers have come from uh, America and the Netherlands, and, uh, and, and really uh, put a lot of effort into uh, bringing some fresh ideas here to Australia. So I'd really like to thank each of them. So uh, just in closing then, I'd just like to acknowledge those who are, are present here at today at the seminar. We have uh, members from the v Vegetable Industry Advisory Committee, representatives from Horticulture Australia, uh, the Ausveg board and, and some of the design teams. And the design teams will be excusing themselves now to go away, reflect on some of this, and consider uh, how your, your levy is invested. Uh, I'd like to also thank all of the growers and other industry representatives who are here today. We really appreciate your ongoing commitment to the Australian vegetable industry. I think the people who come to these conventions and participate and engage are really the, the leaders and the drivers who will see this industry go forward and succeed in the future. So I'd just like to uh, uh, finish up by once again asking you to join me in thanking the uh, presenters. And again, welcome you after the seminar. There's some time for uh, hospitality outside to continue the discussion that's been started here today. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.